One of the areas we are focusing on uh, in our lab, uh, particularly also to understand how placebo effects work and then of course to translate it into clinical practice. And, um, oh, sorry, I have to, yes, now it works. Oh, first, of course, uh, my conflicts of interest, they are not particularly conflicts, but of course I received several grants. Uh, so what you mentioned also during the introduction. Placebo effects, of course, we know uh, from, from clinical practice, particularly from the area of antidepressants. Uh, that was, of course, a quite popular view that at least in uh, low depressive patients, uh, you see that uh, they can be as effective as antidepressants. The same effect you have at least in specific painkillers. Uh, even more spectacular, of course, from the results of surgery, for example, here in osteoarthritis, where you see the same recovery rates after a placebo sham surgery in comparison, in comparison to real surgery. So these are the spectacular clinical uh, applications. And of course, uh, everybody's been very excited about it and see it as a treatment effect that is particularly due to the expectancies and like the daily phenomenon, for example, as uh, we experience already less pain when we take a painkiller, where we have very positive experience of this. And that is more the clinical application, but of course, as a researcher, we are particularly interested in the effects. So what it is doing and how does it work? And in fact, this is not really new, uh, the placebo effect is about expectancy learning and with expectancy learning and application also to physical, uh, to health issues, physical processes. That is uh, why it makes it so exciting. And it's in fact a little bit about body-mind relationship. But the concept of expectancy learning, of course, we know a lot from other areas and only yeah, to, to, to remind you that this is really a common concept we have already a lot of knowledge. And I think one of the most important challenges is also to combine these different fields of expertise. Yeah? So to not only stare into our own uh, areas of placebo research, but to look where we have already a lot of knowledge about these expectancy learning effects, like, uh, uh, of course, from uh, the area of medicine, but also psychotherapy, where uh, the, the non-specific uh, treatment effects uh, uh, are usually also expectancies, um, specific theories uh, that are also quite popular in the area of uh, placebo, like predictive coding. I will come to this later and cognitive neuroscience. But fear conditioning, of course, uh, because conditioning is a central concept, we can learn a lot from all this literature on fear conditioning. Uh, but also in other areas uh, like pain, uh, many of us have some expertise in the area of pain and for example, the fear avoidance model, which is also closely related uh, some concepts to the nocebo effect, um, uh, self-efficacy, helplessness, negative affectivity. Uh, uh, so these different psychological theories have also closely a close relationship with it. And of course, it's important to disentangle it, but at the same time to see also that they all have this expectancy component. Um, I will focus, of course, specifically on research now on placebo effects. And I think one of the nice examples on how to make use of it in clinical practice and how relevant this was, of course, the Hayden administration of drugs where uh, you see clearly that when patients receive a hidden administration, that the effects of painkillers, for example, are much less. And the other side of the coin is, of course, a nocebo effect, which is uh, usually uh, defined as an unfavorable treatment effect, of course, again, due to expectancies. But here again, you have this relationship with other concepts. Uh, and I think it's very important that we clarify also these relationships. Um, and, and for example, we are doing now much more research in the area of fear and anxiety uh, and uh, see that there's a clear relationship between nocebo effects uh, that is strengthened by an anxiety response. And all these different results together, you, you could speak of a negative expectancy bias in a way that 
yeah, that these concepts are in a way closely related. And usually you see that if people have this preference for negative information, then they have a higher risk for, for example, health and disease issues. And of course, quite closely related is also the popular, uh, quite popular predictive coding perspective that we understand now much better how, for example, the brain develops and how we learn specific experiences. And that is the idea that anticipation of future experience and the expectation of a future experience indeed determines directly also the outcome. And this, for example, from the Hamburg lab is a nice study uh, showing, for example, that people react differently uh, to an expensive or non-expensive drug, and which makes clear that, that the, learning, uh, the learning history of these expectancy effects uh, play a huge role. But I also like uh, uh, this type of studies showing how it can translate also to physical symptoms where, for example, you see that uh, comparable brain activity is shown for uh, when you only anticipate a pain stimulation. So when people receive the information that they will expect some uh, pain stimulation in contrast to the real stimulation. It's nice to show, really interesting, that the same areas then are involved. And of course, this theory is also now very popular in, uh, to explain also the more chronic symptoms. Um, you see here different um, studies focusing on this idea that in fact, how these expectancy patterns develop into a chronic uh, consistent phenomenon can largely explain also, for example, the more chronically, un more unexplained or less explained physical symptoms. And of course, we have a lot of evidence that is related to this topic. For example, when you see that uh, concepts like worrying, catastrophizing, and pain are one of the most important risk factors. Um, so there is, in fact, already also a lot of evidence to show that this also plays a role in patients, in uh, clinical practice, and so on. So overall, we have a lot of um, evidence to see that it has a huge impact on all kinds of uh, uh, outcomes, particularly if we look indeed also to the other uh, uh, areas, not only focusing uh, specifically to the placebo and nocebo literature, but taking all this literature on expectancy learning into account. But of course, it's now important to understand what is there going on. So let me first uh, focus on these learning aspects of expectancy learning. Um, generally, what we study usually, and most uh, placebo researchers, are three uh, learning mechanisms. It's, of course, uh, verbal suggestions, uh, the conditioning, but also the social learning. And what we know is that the results of verbal suggestions are more inconsistent. It seems to work better, somewhat better for nocebo. This might be uh, due because people have an, uh, uh, an, uh, an, an bias for negative information uh, from an evolutionary perspective uh, and, and conditioning usually in combination with verbal suggestion has more stable effects and more long-term effects. Um, and most importantly, of course, it works also for the physiological responses. Social learning, in contrast, is much less studied, um, particularly in uh, less also in combination with other mechanisms. And that this is a basic, basic phenomenon. It's really nice to see, for example, in this type of animal research. Um, it's an, a traditional study, uh, very nicely shown that operant conditioning uh, works um, in pain. Uh, like a placebo effect, in fact, what they did was expose these two groups of um, uh, rats with and without a painkiller to uh, pain, uh, which was then followed by, a, by, a, uh, uh, by this placebo treatment. And they saw that uh, the group uh, rats that received previously the painkiller responded indeed with less pain. And how they measure it then is that they show 
uh, that they observe the behavior of the rats. Otherwise, of course, it's not possible. You can't ask them, but they, they, they observe them and they can indicate them specific pain behavior. Um, now, this is a nice example from animal research. I think it's always very important to have also this evidence if it's possible from animal research. So I will, will show you sometimes some results of animal research. In the area of physical symptoms, we did a lot of research on pain and particularly also itch. Uh, of course, in pain, it's well known. In itch, it might be less known for you. But in fact, it's a little bit the same that we use an administration of quantitative sensory testing. And for itch, we use an histamine, uh, sometimes capsaicin, but it's less, uh, uh, it's less consistent. And uh, uh, it induces also more pain than itch. Um, Co-itch is a quite uh, stable itch uh, induction method, and uh, particularly also histamine. And these processes also play a role, for example, in patients with skin diseases. Um, then, of course, you manipulate the different expectancy mechanisms. And for example, what uh, we usually find also, not only in pain, but also in it, it's a combination of verbal suggestions and conditioning is what I said, uh, uh, most effective and most stable. Um, so we were also interested to see whether also social learning might work also in it um, and uh, in other areas. And this was a study what we did in it, we induced college and uh, on the arms and here you see the three conditions uh, with the uh, uh, compared classical conditioning observational learning and sham conditioning and uh, the results uh, show that it might be also indeed and possible effective learning strategy however it was a little bit less effective than the combination of um, conditioning and verbal suggestion uh, one of the uh, recent studies, which is nice to show shortly, is that we also were interested in the combination of all these learning strategies, because um, in fact, there's no study that have ever compared all these possibilities to show whether indeed, for example, three learning strategies might be work even better, or that it depends and that conditioning might be a better learning strategy than social phenomenon, because the conditioning, of course, induces uh, possibly more long-term effects. Um, so what we did uh, is uh, we induced placebo analgesia and heat pain in healthy subjects, and uh, it's the same uh, procedure as we use also in many other experiments. And we manipulated with uh, colors uh, conditioning uh, uh, condition stimuli. Uh, here's a little bit of the design then that we had three main conditions for verbal suggestions, classical conditioning and observational learning. And for all of them, we had also control manipulation. And here then the overall design that we had uh, eight conditions. So it's really a complex experiment. So what you see with the control condition, we had three um, the single conditions and three combined conditions and one condition with all three uh, uh, with all three uh, learning uh, techniques. And of course, we, um, we had an acquisition and an evocation phase. And it was a between subject design of eight groups. Uh, and here are the results, uh, uh, at least an impression of the results. The interesting thing was that the combination of two strategies were all effective. There were no difference between these two strategies. And of course, Perhaps if you would have more power, you might see slight differences. But in fact, uh, and our, um, uh, for us, it was uh, overall the same. Uh, one strategy was indeed not yet uh, effective. So that was also not different. So the interesting thing is that uh, we really saw comparable results. Um, but, and that is, I think, also for the first time, the combination of free learning techniques was clearly more effective than the combination of two or one learning strategy. So it seemed to be that the learn, more learning strategies you combine, the stronger the effect is. And that made also, might also make sense. Eh? Imagine that you have conditioning experience from a previous experience, 
um, that the painkiller works quite well. Uh, you have the, the suggestion of a, of a health professional. Plus, you have also the positive experience of your friend who has told, tells you that, that, that he's really also very positive about his painkiller. So it makes sense that, that all these different combining these different learning strategies might be most effective. Um, so that's interesting also to think about clinical application and clinical trials. Yeah, so it might indeed mean that um, we can add therapeutic effectivity if we indeed more uh, 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 efficiently combine the different strategies. Um, it's good to see that this sound that only works in pain. Uh, we have shown, of course, several results in itch, but uh, shortly only to see that this phenomenon also work, of course, in other areas. This was one of the first studies on nausea, for example, where uh, you see indeed uh, uh, similar results. Um, breathlessness, uh, there are less studies on breathlessness, but there are a lot of conditioning studies. Um, so not really breathlessness studies on placebo and nocebo effects, but particularly uh, uh, on conditioning. And there it's clearly seen that um, uh, breathlessness can be induced. And there are also some patient studies. Um, uh, this, for example, was one of these studies showing that uh, the induction of asthmatic symptoms um, uh, worked indeed. Uh, but only when they were confronted with a specific context. And this was particularly true also for patients with high negative effectivity. Uh, and these uh, individual differences, of course, also very, very interesting um, to see whether these nocebo effects might indeed work better, uh, works stronger, better is of course <laughs> relative, but works stronger in particularly patients with a particularly patient profile like a high negative effectivity. Um, but I'm sure that at the same time, this uh, result has not been found in all studies. So you really have to understand it better, what might be the individual differences that play also a role. Of course, this phenomenon of learning plays also a role in uh, the area of physiological systems, like the immune and endocrine system. And we in our group are also particularly interested in this type of phenomenon. So I will show you also some recent results in this area. Of course, you know this uh, phenomenon of learned immune responses. Um, here nicely shown in this paper of Benedetti yeah, that you induce uh, 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 combined cyclosporin, for example, with the condition stimulus, and uh, uh, that you see then if you only apply the condition stimulus, uh, the same immune response. And this, of course, has been done in animals and, um, and humans. Here's a little bit an overview of um, results shown for immune suppression, immune stimulation, but of course, interestingly, also in allergies, we also replicated uh, results, for example, in the system in, in, uh, in the induction of uh, allergies. Um, uh, interestingly, also here, of course, are also several animal studies, and because there are always ethical concerns, particularly, of course, if you induce an, uh, an inflammatory response in humans. So um, it's nice to show what is there on animal research. I only show you here two studies. Uh, interesting, for example, that here in mice with immune encephalitis that were conditioned indeed that uh, they showed a decrease in their disease severity, which indicates that indeed this might have also uh, clinical uh, implications, perhaps if this can be translated to humans. Another study I like, it's an old study, and the problem I find a little bit, this is animal studies, that you see not many replications. Um, this might be also a publication bias, and uh, I think we need much, much more replication studies in this area. 
Um, but nice to show here that in these rats with rheumatoid arthritis that were conditioned with cyclosporin, they showed also this interrupt in progress of arthritis. And uh, we have a specific interest also in rheumatoid arthritis. So this might be indeed an interesting model, of course, to that might lead to uh, medication uh, reduction. Uh, I will show you later some results of a pilot study we conducted in this area. But of course, it's not only the immune system, also the endocrine system. Uh, uh, and my colleague, Alexandrina Skotsova, has a specific focus on these endocrine responses. And we conducted there also several human studies for cortisol and our replication study on insulin. I will show you the results in a few minutes. And of course, showed also that oxytocin can be conditioned. So important to know that this phenomenon also, of course, applies to the immune system, at least to uh, endocrine system, at least to some of these phenomena. These are um, one of the famous studies. So of course, it's an older study now, but a nice design showing uh, when you uh, uh, induce insulin in healthy uh, men, they use during the learning phase and compares into a placebo condition. And at day two, you induce a placebo um, uh, uh, only then uh, clearly you see at day one that there's clear insulin effect here. Well, at day two, it's of course only a learning effect. And here you see nicely the insulin response, which is a very yeah a nice uh, example of how this might work also for the endocrine system. However, the same problem you have here also that studies are frequently not replicated. And of course, these are very complex studies and there's not, um, it's also almost impossible to do an exact replication study. We tried this in this area and applied this also to diabetes in the two patients. And the interesting thing is then of course that it's usually not possible to exactly replicate a design because uh, methodologies changed and the specific details. But as far as possible, we try to replicate it. It's uh, now in press studies uh, conducted together with my uh, colleague, Alexandrina Skotsova. And we asked whether pharmacological conditioning with intranasal insulin uh, could affect indeed uh, glucose, insulin, hunger, memory, and other phenomena in healthy controls. And we not included only men, but uh, uh, women and men. Well, in previous studies, only men were included. And also patients with diabetes 2, type 2, uh, which uh, were not on medication, but received metformin. Uh, because in this uh, patient group, it, was, it makes only sense uh, that insulin conditioning might work. Um, we used the same design as Ulrike, um, uh, and a uh, uh, condition group, again, with the odor and insulin, a control group only with placebo and odor, and of course, on day two, we had only the placebo with the odor. And uh, on both days, we had uh, eight um, uh, inductions of insulin. So there are several uh, learning trials uh, what we use. Um, and we had uh, indeed 32 patients and health controls. Here are the results uh, that are now um, published. Um, only a short summary because the results were quite uh, yeah, complex. Um, the nice thing was to see that there were conditioned responses, um, but you, as it usually is, it's not exactly the same as what was published in previous studies, but there was a clear indication that uh, we saw conditioned responses and that was particularly for blood glucose levels. And they were found in patients and in healthy men, but not in women. Um, so for patients, it was both in health uh, in women and men, and in the healthy uh, controls, it was only found for men. 
And uh, uh, the interesting thing is also when you look at these previous studies, and we discussed this also with Ulrika, that she said indeed that there are huge uh, gender differences, and that of course was endocrine system. And she advised it also to do this experiments only in men. So that was indeed a confirmation that uh, there might be some uh, sex differences here. Yeah. So a very interesting additional effect we also found was a hunger effect. That's a conditioning with intranasal insulin decreased hunger. And here again, we found some differences between patients and um, healthy subject that it was only the case. And yet we see here the results on the right side that on the left, these are the hunger results for the healthy controls, but there's no effect for the patients quite dearly. So uh, this might indicate that this insulin conditioning might be interesting for the future, of course, also for other groups. Um, for example, for um, people with eating disorder, or other uh, uh, eating problems. Um, so this might be, of course, a very interesting result where we have to do some follow-up studies. Okay, yeah, and then I come to uh, the clinical implications and the clinical studies, because uh, this type of studies indeed, in, yeah, are, of course, fascinating in the lab. But we have, of course, also to do something for our patients. I'm also a psychotherapist, so I'm always interested in how we can apply these, these things to clinical practice. And I love this, um, this overview of Tor Weger and Laura Atlas, a very nice uh, uh, um, overview where you see the different possibilities, what we have as a placebo and nocebo researcher, or we, what how we can manipulate all these context factors that might all have an effect on this expectancy learning phenomenon of placebo and nocebo effects. And if you would like to structure this a little bit, you can uh, at least distinguish three levels that you can, uh, of course, have uh, expectancy learning treatment, more psychologically oriented for the patients. You can, of course, uh, work on the patient provider interactions. And you can, of course, work on the application like the medicine with pharmacotherapeutic conditioning. And I will show you on each level some recent results what we are doing here in Leiden at Leiden University in our lab. So let's start with um, expectancy learning treatments. Um, uh, one uh, um, thing when you, when you understand the learning phenomenon of conditioning, which is um, usually the most um, effective um, uh, strategy, is uh, to think about clinical implications, uh, yeah, what you can do to relearn this experience, particularly, for example, in nocebo phenomenon. And one technique is here, counter conditioning. We used a lot, and we have now a lot of experiences. And that means it's a very old methods. In fact, it has been used in PTSS and other phenomena, but um, it's less popular, for example, than other techniques like exposure or others, uh, but might particularly work well in the area of placebo and nocebo effect, because what you do is that you change a negative experience into a positive one. And uh, uh, this was one of the first experiments we did here in the area of itch. So we had three groups um, that received all first uh, nocebo uh, induction. Uh, but then the positive expectation group then received the positive uh, expectation, again, with uh, conditioning and verbal suggestion. The negative expectation induction received twice the negative expectancy, and the extinction group had nothing in the second phase. So all received uh, the first phase a nocebo induction, but then they differed on positive expectancy or again a negative or doing nothing with extinction. And what you can see here nicely is that the negative expectancy induction leads to even worse nocebo effect. So there you see again this double effect. So if you repeat a nocebo induction, it, it, it becomes worse. Um, the extinction uh, clearly shown that it is 
uh, uh, still there is a nocebo effect, so there is not a total extinction phase. But most interestingly, of course, it was here to see that this positive expectancy induction even leads to a placebo effect. So it, in the lab, at least, it was uh, easy to change the negative induction into a positive expectancy. Um, and this was then in the itch, what we did for itch histamine. As a follow-up, we did uh, several experiments also in this area. Um, for example, we were interested um, because we know already that from the regular conditioning experiments that partial uh, reinforcement might be indeed work better for, um, uh, for the extinctions uh, effect. Um, so it's interesting. Oh, sorry. There's a problem with slides. Here we are again. Um, so we were interested in comparing the partial and continuous reinforcement schedules for counter conditioning, and we um, uh, whether they might work both. Because from counter conditioning, there were no, yeah, there are not many studies. So this is the first in the area of physical symptoms. And indeed, what we saw here, you see this also in the results that both continuous reinforcement and partial reinforcement were both effective and lead indeed to less, uh, uh, to, to, uh, less nocebo effects than when the counter conditioning was applied. And here you see that the effect also for the continuous reinforcement uh, was a little bit stronger. This is also what you usually see um, and we compared them later also for the extinction processes. I will show you this later. Um, yeah, this is here the result for the extinction process. And that is what we expected also, because we know from partial reinforcement that if you do not continuously offer a um, conditioning method, but more partially, uh, from the fear literature, there's quite a lot of evidence that this is a strategy with more long-term effects because it is more resistant to extinction. And that is exactly also what we found in this experiment. Um, if you would, when we were interested, of course, to bring it to clinical practice. So then you have to check whether this might also work as an open label. Uh, a learning method because if you don't if you can't do this open label then you have really a problem in a clinical practice so this was one of the um, uh, experiments we were interested in here first what we did is again first a nocebo conditioning and then uh, had three uh, uh, conditions again the counter conditioning the nocebo conditioning and the extinction and compared it also to placebo conditioning. Um, and here we were particularly interested if this open, if we do this in an open label, well, it might also work. And that is so uh, indeed what we found. It was quite convincing that even also if you have open label conditioning, it was much more effective than expansion and uh, also again than the continued nocebo conditioning. Um, then we thought it's, in, it's interesting us to see whether to combine it uh, might indeed uh, work open label counter conditioning less than the closed label counter conditioning. Because usually you see when you apply an open label placebo that the effects can be quite strong, but on average, at least in the lab, they are a little bit uh, lower than the closed label uh, conditioning experiment. But surprisingly, we found uh, the best effects here for the open label counter conditioning. It was much, much more effective than extinction. And the closed label was indeed not, um, there was no uh, difference. And, uh, but it might also make sense because what you do here is then work with an extra verbal suggestion that you outline uh, what you are doing to explain indeed this is the conditioning effect so that it might indeed have an extra learning effect but it's also nice of course to know for clinical practice that this open label counter conditioning works uh, even better than the closed label counter conditioning 
then of course it's nice to think about the therapeutic application really for patients. And that's always a little bit a challenge. You might recognize this, that if you want to translate, translate an experiment, experimental procedure into clinical practice, you have to adjust it because otherwise patients do not accept it and it's not feasible. Um, uh, however, at the same time, you, you try to be as close as possible to the experimental manipulation where you know that it will. So what we did here is indeed exactly translated these open label counter conditioning procedures during experimental sessions uh, to a patient sample. In this case, it were uh, fibromyalgia patients. And we did this several times because uh, uh, if, if, if uh, we repeat the same, of course, we know that it might work better. So we invited them for eight weeks and every week uh, uh, they received this experimental session of open label counter conditioning. And we told them also that this might indeed work for the clinical pain. Um, that they relearn the negative experiences eh, that they might have indeed uh, suffer also from a nocebo effect due to chronic negative expectancies and having no solutions and so on. And that uh, learning, relearn the, uh, this experience in the lab might also help them for their, to cope with their clinical pain. Uh, it was nice to see that this was indeed well accepted, this story and uh, that they understand the idea and, and, and that they are really open for this type of um, new uh, interventions. We combined it also with homework assignments because uh, it's important we know of course for generalization in daily life to have to make this transfer with for example homework assignments where they're um, uh, associated this uh, pain stimulation for example with uh, particularly painkiller or other pain-related issues they had in daily life. Uh, it was a, a pilot study in 18 patients. Of course, it's a small power, but it was indeed to, to see whether this might indeed, uh, we would see some effects in the good direction. So here was again, open label counter conditioning during six, sorry, it was six weekly experimental sessions, not eight together with homework assessments. And we also had a three and six months follow-up. And uh, uh, what we did is indeed, uh, uh, we, we compared an open label counter conditioning with a sham conditioning. So that we had two groups during this scene, six weeks. And what we saw then is that there was a high feasibility as I already told you, the treatment story uh, was well accepted. It was also a high treatment satisfaction and a relatively low dropout. So this is very promising for clinical practice. And when we saw uh, the results, we showed indeed that there was a clear larger reduction of the nocebo effect in the open label counter conditioning. So it worked for the experimental manipulation. That is of course something we knew already. And of course, we hope to see also some changes in daily life in the clinical pain, but that's what not the case. So the translation to daily life, this is some of the challenges, for example, with a homework assignment, make it more effective. Uh, uh, there's still an, uh, a challenge to translate these results. So this is one of the big, big challenges, I think also for our field, to translate all these promising experimental results into something that really works also, for the clinical pain of our patients. And we yeah, will conduct, of course, also future studies in this area. <laughs> this is an, an example for the expectancy treatments uh, for the patients. Now I come to the professional. Uh, uh, we are also focusing on the doctor-patient communication. Uh, you might know this uh, clinical consensus we had uh, as a result of the previous SIPS conferences where we had indeed specific recommendations also for professionals that they should be trained also in communication about placebo and nocebo effects. So we thought it's important indeed to have and develop some of these tools. <clears throat> um, uh, but first indeed, this is, this is a nice study well known uh, showing the difference between two 
instructions. And that we know, for example, that only one instruction can make a huge difference here during a medical procedure in pregnant women. And um, uh, what I told them in the nocebo condition is you will feel a hard sting. This is the worst pain. While in the placebo conditioning, they, uh, uh, they said that you will receive a local painkiller. And indeed, what you see here also nicely is that in the placebo condition, they, they uh, perceive much less pain. So only an instruction of a, a healthcare provider can make a huge difference. And there are, of course, many more studies in this area. So we thought it's important indeed to develop some tools that uh, we can provide and help this uh, provider, patient provider interactions. So we developed uh, three different tools in e-learning and virtual reality and an app and an ESC uh, grant. And uh, 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 the e-learning was uh, that they learned as a first step how to use the placebo effects and minimize its, uh, the nocebo and the virtual reality in the app then to practice indeed also patient provider interactions. And the goals were that we, of course, familiarize uh, healthcare professionals with the knowledge about it, so to increase their knowledge, to raise awareness, of course, and to obtain also specific skills. So first, uh, e-learning, I will give you a little bit of an overview. Um, we uh, had also several focus groups and uh, uh, developed this uh, together with all these stakeholders and uh, also with international experts. And we decided that we will focus our lean learning on four different areas that are closely related to placebo and nocebo and expectancies of treatment rationale outline and risk and side effects in the therapeutic relationship. This e-learning is now freely available. That's also nice for the implementation, uh, only in Dutch, so sorry, for the international uh, public. Uh, but at this moment, it is uh, available on the Dutch Institute for Responsible Medicine use, and uh, um, healthcare professionals can also um, receive uh, accreditation uh, points here. We have five modules that consist of um, text and video and other materials and uh, task assignments. Uh, focusing on uh, patient relationships, uh, expectancies, treatment rationales, uh, risks and side effects, and also explaining placebo and nocebo effects to patients. And we launched it in 2022, and uh, with the first the users, we saw indeed a high satisfaction. And uh, I have to say that the Dutch Institute is very enthusiastic uh, about this module and would like to also continue to offer it to all healthcare professionals in the Netherlands. And nicely, I said, this is an institute which is very, very well known uh, among all health professionals in the Netherlands. So um, yeah, that's nice to see how yeah, you can implement these tools. And what people said is it's a good variation, it's accessible, and uh, many practical tips are given and so on. Um, but of course, only the e-learning is not enough. So we thought about a very concrete communication tool. And uh, the problem with communication tools are usually that you need an actor. So we were very interested in virtual reality to see whether virtual reality could be used also to practice this patient's uh, provider interactions and to obtain specific skills. Um, and the interesting thing of this specific tool what we developed is that it gives not only a spoken feedback to the uh, what you said. So this is, of course, that exists already uh, in several countries. But what is really new about our tool is that it gives also automatic feedback on your nonverbal behavior. So what you are doing uh, during the virtual reality as a healthcare professional, there the patients will respond differently to your nonverbal responses. Hey, you see, yeah, this is one case and we, you have to work a long time on a case and then you have to practice this, that the case knows all the possible responses of healthcare providers and can uh, respond to it. And this is another case uh, 
uh, very uh, where they practice a specific, uh, uh, for example, medical procedure, like uh, that the patient here, for example, receives an injection, is anxious about it. So we simulate a situation of nocebo effects. And also here, there was a high uh, satisfaction. This was only a first trial. Now we are much far uh, further. But here in the first usability studies, it was also already quite positive about it. But it's a reality, of course, then you need the specific classes. And so we did the same also to develop an app uh, that they can use and practice in between with the specific app. So again, that was the same goal to obtain the skills. And um, the nice thing is that we now um, have the ambition to translate it in this European project. We are conducting with several other uh, European universities like um, uh, uh, Bologna, Madrid, uh, and others, where we have a network now on, uh, to work on education material for placebo and nocebo effects. And uh, one idea is that we translate the first step now, the e-learning to other countries. Uh, there's also a German partner, so that might be also interesting for you. And um, uh, uh, we, of course, are also interested not only to translate the e-learning, but perhaps also the virtual reality too. Okay, that's about doctor-patient communication. And then I uh, come to the last one, which is of course the most exciting because it might directly have an effect on health and disease outcomes is the pharmacotherapeutic conditioning. Of course, you, you know this phenomenon. And of course, when you see the literature on immune and endocrine conditioning, it makes sense that we apply this also to clinical practice. Uh, and the strange thing is that uh, usually in clinical practice, you see a lot of standard doses, uh, but uh, customized uh, doses might, might, uh, make, uh, oh, might work much better. I see I have to um, hurry up. So sorry. Um, uh, so I will really hurry up then for the last minute. Um, we know that pharmacological conditioning might indeed work uh, for medication dose reduction. Uh, there are several uh, studies have been done, for example, here in psoriasis, uh, where patients were treated on a partial schedule of pharmacological reinforcement, and these patients had the same benefits and the uh, patients with standard conditions. Um, here you see some of these results. I will skip this now. We have also some results in renal patients, uh, what has been done indeed in your group. Uh, very interesting to see that the pharmacological conditioning might also work here and has an effect here showing on the T cell capacity. Um, and in ADHD, for example, where we also work with this dose reduction in children with ADHD and uh, using a placebo conditioning or a dose reduction or full dose. And uh, yeah, to summarize it only because of time, you see indeed um, uh, that uh, here also the dose reduction has a very positive effect also and might have a lot of consequences, of course, for our clinical practice, for medication use, regular care, and of course, our patients. But perhaps most importantly, to learn more about brain, body, brain mechanisms, and that is why the placebo and nocebo effects, of course, are so interesting. So thank you for all my staff and all the people working together, and uh, that is it.